And so I'm working uh, to develop and curate uh, new collections from all over the world. And we're really super excited about that. As well, uh, with the Smithsonian, I've been developing these master workshops, which have been very interesting. Uh, we've been working with the Center for Traditional Textiles with Nilda Kayanwapa to develop a six hour backstrap weaving workshop, as well as a natural dye with cochineal with Porfirio Guterres. And that's been really exciting to see the response to that. I think there are so many people that are itching to make and they want that experience. And it's something that I've been hearing a lot about. We're calling it the experience economy now. So I'm really curious to explore that a little bit more. Um, but beyond that, um, I work as a designer and work, you know, all, all over the world. Um, uh, currently, I'm working in the South Pacific in, in Fiji. Uh, and it's uh, been really interesting as I've been exploring uh, this distance design online, as I'm sure a lot of you have been exploring that as well. And while uh, it's, it's not the same as being in someone's studio, it still is the next best, best thing. And actually, I think we're getting a lot accomplished. So in, in Fiji, um, we've, been, we, we've been continuing to innovate during this whole pandemic. And we're working with remote rural women um, who do this incredible hand-woven uh, mats and baskets out of natural fiber as well as developing kind of a contemporary, more contemporary um, textile line. Uh, as well, um, I've been working in Armenia with designers there who are also working with um, artisans with, in stone and jewelry and uh, textiles and metalwork. And that's been like super exciting as well. Um, and also, I'm working with an organization in South Africa called Bridge for Africa. Maybe some of you know it. We're working with recycled material. So it's been really interesting. You know, when you're working with a large group of people, I've been sending designs ahead. People go and then um, using that as inspiration, they uh, begin to make samples, add their own um, inspirations, and then we come back together again as a group and we edit and we talk about it and then we do another round of design. So that's basically how our um, online sessions have been working. And I think it's a good alternative. We continue to innovate and dream up new ideas, which is so important right now, you know, because we know that at its core, design is a strategic business tool to help build your sales. So um, we've been using this time to continue, continue innovating and designing. Amazing. It sounds like so many different exciting projects that are going on and, and also just great to hear how dis distance design is working um, well. I know we've all had to adapt and just um, collaborating overseas and not being in person together has its own challenges, certainly. So my next question for you is, um, what are some, what are your best tips for an artist and business who is looking to find inspiration for a new product line? That's a great question and a, a really fun one too. Um, just the beginning of any project is, is, is really fun. Um, I can tell you what I do for myself. I, I do a lot of research. And all year long, I am collecting ideas and those ideas might end up on a bulletin board or they could end up in a binder or I paste them on a board. So, and, and that could be anything from um, a, a textile scrap that I've found or a color or maybe a color scheme, maybe a leaf I found on the ground, maybe a phrase or um, words, all of those kind of feed into my design process. Um, 
and then they often end up into inspiration boards. So it's kind of like I'm collecting all this collage material, which then I can rearrange. And it's amazing how that works. You really get great ideas that way because a lot of these things are coming up from your subconscious. Um, just things that you like. And I'm a firm believer is to gravitate towards the things that you love because there are so many trends out there, right? So find one thing that you might like to do and or a category or a product um, and explore that and give time for your creativity. That's the other thing, you know, build it into your process and build in spending time with other creative people or designers because there's so much synergy that can happen with back and forth idea with ideas. Um, so that's really helpful. Um, ask people what they think. And also, you know, I do some research online, but I'm not totally, um, you know, I'm not, you know, driven by it entirely. Um, there's so many resources out there now and so many industry experts. For example, Pantone gives excellent color forecasting and a great wealth of information. There's people like Lee Edelcourt and Textile Eye and Pattern Bank, and even one of um, another ATA consultant, Patty Carpenter, who is doing wonderful trend reports these days. Actually, she's in Paris right now, gathering up her next, her next inspiration to share with all of us. So um, there's, you know, don't be overwhelmed by it because there's so much. That's why I say, take a couple things and gravitate towards, towards that. Um, as well, um, I find a lot of inspiration in museums, and especially when we're talking about developing artisan brands so much, um, there's so much inspiration to be had there. Whenever, when, it, when we get back to traveling, it's the first thing I do is go back, is go to the museums. Um, but why this is so helpful is that you can find ideas that are deeply rooted in tradition. And for any kind of work that I'm doing, especially with artisans, depending on what they're cultural heritage is. I like to start at that place. Um, and let's see, what else? Um, that's a lot of great ideas. I think that's um, fabulous. And you mentioned um, looking at trend, uh, trend inspiration and Patty Carpenter, um, who you mentioned is one of our e-market readiness program presenters. And, and I actually just spoke to her this morning. She's confirmed she's gonna come and do um, another free Facebook Live with us on October 4th. So join us if you are here now, um, join us again on October 4th and we'll, we'll be chatting to Patty Carpenter about her uh, latest trend finds. So not, this, not to be missed. <laughs> yes. But one thing I did wanna say about the inspiration and the design is just, keep designing, keep innovating. Remember, it's a process. Mm -hmm. So some ideas may not gel, but others will. And it's it's a way to just, just keep moving forward, I think. That's the main thing. Yeah, that's great. And we've got um, about a number of people live here. So hi, everyone who's just joined us. Um, we've got Mimi Robinson here, who is a product designer and developer. And so we are here to answer your questions as we go. So please feel free to pop in the chat um, as we go, any questions that you have for Mimi, and we'll we'll ask those for, for you as we go along. Um, but I, bringing up trends, I'd love to hear your insights into, you know, what do you think are some of the biggest industry or product trends that you see coming up in 2021-2022? Wow, looking at the crystal ball, huh? Okay, well, well, first of all, I think a lot of us probably know what these trends are. Everyone is working from home now and everybody's at home. So there's a lot of home related trends um, that could include everything from the home office to storage solutions. We're seeing a lot of people redecorating their homes. Um, and as more people continue to be at home, I think that there's a resurgence in baking and cooking and gardening activities and all of those related products. I think as we move towards the holiday, um, some of the trends we'll see in gifts will probably be towards more of the 
board games and puzzles and books that bring people together. It's kind of the antidote to being online. That was very strong during the pandemic. I think that probably will continue. And I'm also seeing that self-care is a really big trend or, you know, wellness, well-being. Um, I think people are trying to create their parts of their homes as sanctuaries and, and refuges. Refuge. And so you can think about natural home products and remedies, natural fibers, bath and body products, maybe even your own spa robe. I, I think um, I'm seeing trends that stimulate your senses. Again, it's the antidote. We've been on Zoom forever. So anything that can kind of bring us back and make us present to where we are right now. Um, in Fiji, I'm working on developing, uh, we're, we're putting together a, a traditional remedies line, working with some of the local plant materials there, like lemongrass, you know what that scent is, it's so fresh and stimulating. But I think, again, things that stimulate your senses, that make you feel good, um, and, and all help foster wellness. Um, those are some of the trends I'm seeing, but I still think that handmade is, is a huge trend. Actually, it's not really a trend. It's gone mainstream at this point, but it's still, people still love the handmade. And I think in these times, it's a, anybody that is uh, working in the artisan sector, it's a very exciting place to be. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge business and it continues to grow. Um, and I think that the things to think about really are no matter what the trend is, have a, a good product with good quality at a good price with a wonderful story. Yeah. Uh, customers want to know who made the product, how it was made, why it was made, and what impact their dollars are going to make. So those are the three things I always keep in the back of my mind. Um, Wonderful. So I'm sure probably a lot of you, Lauren, what kind of trends have you seen out there? Um, I think I agree with the wellness uh, wellness trend and home uh, with people being uh, inside more in the pandemic. People are spending more time in home. They're having offices in their in their homes as well. So it's in, you know thinking about how you could create products for a desk, uh, organization storage is huge. Um, I think people can't get enough of of storage right now. Um, just because everyone is spending this time that they weren't necessarily and want to be surrounded by beautiful things. And I and I agree with all what you said about the experience um, economy and. And just having um, things that stimulate the senses, all, all fabulous ideas. And we've got a, a bunch of different comments and hellos um, coming from our Facebook uh, comments. So Maura is saying hello. Hi, Maura. Hey, and Maura. <laughs> Dana, Fabio, uh, David, uh, Debbie, Jean, uh, Jean, and yes. Yeah, wow. Wonderful. Hi, everyone. So good to see you all. Um, hey. That's great to have so many people tuning in live. So I wanted to ask you another question about um, sustainability. You know, one of the big trends we've been seeing is certainly climate change is a real thing. And every aspect, every business is going to be asked uh, in the coming years, how are you building sustainability into your products, into your offerings? So how would you um, suggest an artisan business think about sustainability um, for their product, for their shipping? Yeah, it's such a good question and so important. And I always think of that uh, people, planet, and then profit. So we've got to think about all these things at the same time and think about uh, the whole process. It's a very holistic process. It's sustainability is the whole process. So. You want to think about all the steps from the procuring of the materials to the materials themselves to the making process and to the packing and shipping and at each point you can ask yourself the question is this sustainable and there are lots of entry points 
in terms of materials, I mean, that's something that designers can really think about because there are, you always have choices for sustainability, but also for health. For example, could I be using more recycled material? Is the paint I am using healthy with no cadmium content? Are the ceramic glazes I'm using lead free? What are the alternatives? Are the earring findings I am using um, have the right metal composition so they can pass international trade regulations? So you really want to do your homework on this. Um, I think the packing and shipping is something that we can all look at um, and, um, and make sure that we're doing it as efficiently as possible. I think so, remember to source locally as much as possible and avoid as much plastic as we can. Yeah. But I think it's something we're all still learning and growing. I think we just all have to keep studying and um, educating ourselves about how we can best do this. And I don't know if you, do if you have any recommendations, Lauren, on places where people can go to learn more about this? I think, um, you know, being creative in your packing and shipping materials is a, is a big thing. Uh, and, you know, your local community is going to be a good resource. You know, every country has their own sort of availability of packing and shipping supplies um, and just using recycled whenever is possible, uh, you know, without to the detriment of the quality of the, of the product. Um, but also, you know, just thinking about it in your design, like, is it possible to nest products? You know, right. can you create something that is going to be more efficient just in the design itself when you're shipping a product? I think those are things to think about. And um, I think the materials themselves too. Yeah. Uh, for example, I'm working with a group in Armenia and they work in stone. The cost of shipping stone is so expensive. It, it's just not a sustainable thing to do. So they're kind of thinking about alternative materials that they can use. Yeah. So things like that in your choice of materials as well. So we've got a question um, and I think it's a good one. So let's see, as a, so Janelle asks, as a designer or product developer, if you are not working with an organization like ATA who vets and facilitates the production prices, what would be some pertinent questions to ask the artisans and make sure they're asking for fair prices to themselves? Um, this would be a situation working directly with artisans and not through someone like ATA Artisans. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that um, you're talking a lot, of, if, if I'm getting the question correctly, you're really wanting to get an understanding of the costing and pricing. Mm -hmm. And um, Lauren is an expert on that. And you're going to be doing an upcoming uh, seminar on that, correct? Not only in the EMRP training, but also in the Artisan Business Lab. So it would be really helpful to probably take that course but do you have any like little tips that you could just sure yeah um yeah it's a good question and i do think you know it is important to make sure that you know production prices are being fairly paid and you know really thinking um you know the questions that you can and ask an artist in business um or you know have the producers ask themselves is like you know, what really are their monthly costs? Um, coming up with a wage isn't necessarily as simple as like determining what the minimum wage of the country can be, is. Um, you know, if you really want to dig into, you know, what is the cost of living for the specific producers that you're, you know, that you're working with um, and help guide them through that process of, you know, how much, you know, how many people do you have contributing to your household income? Are you thinking about, um, you know, putting money away for your savings, education for kids, um, making sure you'll be able to cover health expenses if you have an emergency, uh, and not just living, you know, hand to mouth or feeling like, you know, they can only cover food and sort of um, lodging. So, you know, just 
that exercise of going through a household budget um, is really valuable and it can be kind of shocking sometimes, um, even for, you know, like me, you know, or, uh, you know, any, any person who knows a lot about costing, it can be a really great exercise um, to just really like figure out what are my real costs and um, what, what do I need to make in order to, uh, to, to have a living that is, um, that is worth my time uh, to do the artisan work. So that would be my suggestion. And also, of course, we're going to talk about this more at the e-market readiness programs. We have a whole session about costing and pricing. And um, I'm also busy working on a whole costing and pricing in-depth um, course for the Artisan Business Lab as well. So that's coming soon. Okay, so one more question we have. Um, Mimi, are there any videos that show a distance design session to give us a sense of how you interact with artisans, develop design iterations with them, and overcome any hurdles inherent in working virtually rather than in person? Wow, great question. No, not to my knowledge, but I think we should make one, Lauren. It's a great it's a idea. idea. Because I think it's a whole yeah. new, I don't think this is going to go away. You know, maybe once we do get back to traveling, it will be a hybrid model. And I think you, you know, each group is so different. So I think um, you're going to have different concerns with each group. But I think um, overall, I mean, just meeting on a regular basis, you know, starting with a design, giving time for people to make things, coming back together again for the sharing and learning and talking, going back again to the drawing board and then coming together again. I found that to be a great rhythm. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I think it's an interesting point that you make and we'll, we'll think about that, putting together some kind of, uh, you know, helpful YouTube or video on that. Thank you for the contribution, that's excellent. Okay, so we have hello from Diane and from David. Hi. Uh, let's see. Caroline asks, she says, I was recently told at New York Now that I need to make my product lines appeal more to U.S. clients. Any tips here? What kind of pro where are you from and what kind of products do you have? Let's see if we can get Caroline to answer. Caroline, any more information about your products and what uh what categories what what country you're working from we'll give her a moment to to okay. respond well, i guess i would say that the reason if you want to enter into the u.s market you do want to appeal to the u.s buyers right so i think having some kind of understanding um of what the u.s trends are 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 helpful you don't have to be you know, it doesn't have to be 100% because we want your uniqueness to come through. But I think there are certain things around standards. For example, if you're developing cushion covers, make sure that they're standard sizes, that the inserts that they that you put in the pillows are all, you know, that it's standard. So, and, and just make sure there's really good quality. So again, as I said before, keep coming back to, you know, a great product with great quality and with a great story. Yeah, yeah, I think that's key. And and also just, um, you know, whenever you're talking, if you know, you're working with New York now and you have buyers who stop by, ask their feedback. Um, you know, that's a really great way to get direct feedback on your product um, on, you know, what could be tweaked, um, what colors they might wanna see, if there's any issues with like, the texture, it, like sometimes uh, American consumers don't want rough, scratchy wool, whereas like uh, in Europe, they're more used to like that thick wool. So those differences between um, different markets, you can find uh, sometimes just by asking a particular person who's interested. Um, and also I would recommend, you know, if you're looking to export, start exporting to the US um, and want some feedback on products, on your products, this is something we also do at the e-market readiness program. We have small group coaching sessions where you'll get direct feedback on your products, uh, on your business, um, to really help you work through an action plan and a strategy to, um, to start selling um, in that export market. So I would highly recommend checking out the e-market readiness program as well. Okay, so we have another question. Uh, let's see, Debbie says, it is helpful to get baseline data survey of artisans 
That's a great, that's a great suggestion. Um, when you're starting to work with a group, I think for related to the pricing um, data, great. Uh, David says, we are an organization based in Cameroon, Africa, and we are interested in exporting our artisan products to the US market, but the cost of shipping is very high. How can you help us in minimizing the export cost? Yeah, that's, I, I'm running into that all over. Yeah, everybody is. Um, it's, that's a challenging one. I mean, one of the, it, again, it depends on the materials that you're, you're working with. Are you working with, uh, textiles? Because that's a lot easier to, you know, the prices are going to be a little bit lower. So look at the materials that you're working with. And maybe also there are ways to consolidate. Are there other, uh, are, are there other, um, organizations or companies that you could, um, join link arms with? and somehow bring down your shipping costs that way. Um, Lauren, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think if you can, um, you know, approach uh, a shipping company together with other businesses in your area, which are looking to export, sometimes you can negotiate uh, preferred shipping terms and prices. So look at, you know, you know, if you can promise a certain amount of business to them, they can, they can come down on pricing. Also, um, if you're exporting, sometimes importers like to use their own like DHL account uh, because they get better rates than you might be able to get locally. So you can also talk to your buyers and see, um, you know, give them options. I would say research, you know, um, there's LCL shipping, there's container load shipping, but for smaller stuff where you're shipping, you know, air freight, um, looking at the cost of like a DHL or a UPS um, versus like a mail in your country. And what is the reliability of that mail? You know, what are the differences in cost? And when you present that, all that information to your buyers, it can help them make an informed decision and also sort of um, at least give them some options. Okay, so that's a great question too. So we have a, another question um, from Diane. I am planning on developing a skincare line here in Canada. I would like to make it with fair trade ingredients. I'm finding this process overwhelming and I will need some direction. We have two brick and mortar stores and an online store here in Canada. So question is, um, Let's see, just help in finding in that process of trying to find fair trade suppliers. I should I should mention here, we are actually gonna have the World Fair Trade Organization do a presentation. We're doing a free webinar with the World Fair Trade Organization uh, later this month. So I definitely recommend you, you sign up for that and join us there because they'll have a lot of great um, suggestions on fair trade um, and working with fair trade suppliers. So that's one thing. Mimi, anything to add? That's exactly what I would have said too. You know, you get in touch with a fair trade organization because they're going to have a whole list of, you know, people that you can talk to as a starting point. So that makes a lot of sense. And also maybe within your country, within the trade commission, there, there are also people that you can find that are, that, that currently, you know, could help you with their materials, ingredients, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Great. I think those are good suggestions. Okay, Carolina has, has clarified. Um, she was the one who got feedback from New York Now that she wanted something that would appeal more to US customers. She says, I'm from the US, but I work with artisans in Morocco. Oh, well, and you're saying that you, you want to do products that appeal more to US buyers. Okay. Well, I think, you know, again, the handmade sector is huge. Handmade products is, is, is huge. People love seeing products from different parts of the world. I think that you, you just have to make sure that it, first of all, has quality, um, that it's a good price and that there's a wonderful story attached to the product itself. And then I think what I would encourage you to do is maybe look at specific categories in the market that buyers buy to. So if you go to a trade show, it's usually divided up into um, different buying categories, really. You've got tabletop, you've got personal accessories, you have gift, you have um, you know a variety of different categories. So 
or gardening is a category, home, home office is a category. So maybe look at try and develop your products around a category and then put together a collection within each category of five to seven products so they have impact, so it's a story. And each one of those products could have similar colors that, that run through it. So it looks like they're a family, they're a collection. And I think that's how a lot of people approach the US market. And that's what a lot of buyers are looking for because what are they looking for? They're looking for things to freshen up their stores. Um, and, you know, just having a one product by itself, you know, doesn't really do much. But if you have a collection, they may buy that whole collection and it has impact. So think about the category that buyers buy to in the US, that might be a good starting point. I hope that answers your question. That's great. Thank you, Amy. Okay, Mara, um, Mara, who's actually another designer that we have worked with uh, at Eight to Artisan. She's based Hi, Mara. in Africa. Hi. Um, she says it would be great to have a live and online product development session with various designers and producers. Great idea. I think we all like that. <laughs> yeah. Of that live um, demo. I think it would be Let's cool. do it. Okay, great. So let's see. Carolina says, thank you. Learning experience. I'm definitely going to take one of your programs. We'd love to have you. It'd be great to see you there. Uh, she also suggests um, for shipping, if you want to try the American Chamber of Commerce, you can join and they can help you with options and teaming with other companies for shipping. That's a great suggestion. Great idea. Thanks, so, Carolyn. So Diane asks, um, I'm wondering if Mimi's class can help with the developing process. And I'm going to just answer for her. Yes, definitely again. But yeah, t tell us more about the um, your Artisan Business Lab product development class. Sure. So um, the seminar that I've developed really is um, um, a whole, it's the product development steps that are broken down, you know, into every single step along the way that you would take. And uh, what's great about it is that it's self-paced and so you can go at your own speed and um, it reflects all the product development principles that, that I use when I develop my own products. And what's great about this course is that you could take one of your ideas, say you haven't, you know, something that you want to develop and you could take that and you could run that through the whole product development um, course. So uh, it's broken into chapters and there's also a workbook that goes along with it um, to help you move through the through the whole experience. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, me, the, the videos itself are just really bite-sized so that it's easy to sort of go back and forth. So you, as you're going through the process and you want to sort of go back uh, and look at this section again, it's really easy to sort of have, you have bookmarks um, that you can sort of go back to and then use it again and again in your process just to sort of have prompts um, to help you think through all of the different steps um, every time. It's got templates like, um, you know, a timeline uh, set up for how long it takes to do the process. It's got lots of really helpful um, helpful steps and really breaks it down. Uh, there's also a Q&A session um, and we do um, for our next launch for that course, which is gonna be happening after the e-market readiness program, we'll have um, a couple live sessions with Mimi where you'll get feedback um, and you can talk to her and ask questions, so. I'd love to hear more about your product ideas and where you're going with those. But also I wanted to add one thing, in addition to the course, I also offer one-on-one -on -one mentoring that goes alongside that, so if you get stuck um, we can work together hand in hand, and sometimes it's really helpful if you've not gone through too many times to bounce ideas off of one another and really get to that next place. Um, the great thing about this course is that it's, it's a process, and once you've gone through it, you can use it again and again and again and keep getting better at it each time you do it. Yes, definitely. Okay, Carolina says, um, I'm not sure if you do a program that prepares artisans for trade shows, but it would be very helpful. Um, it's a great idea. And yes, we do. Uh, so we, <laughs> yes. Um, and our e-market readiness program is really sort of like 
we always had had held it at the New York Now trade show for like 20 years. Um, so it was really a preparing for a trade show program. Once we went online into the pandemic, um, it's less specific trade show focused and it's more global, but it's really still looking at the export market um, and diversifying your business and your sales channels. So it, for specific trade show help, we also have our team program, which is which is um, coaching and training leading up to an actual physical trade show at Las Vegas Market, and it includes a booth as well as sort of merchandising help and guidance to like actually set up your first uh, trade show booth. So um, once we're doing in-person trade shows again, that is going to be back. But it ha it's been on the hiatus while we're while we're all um, uh, waiting from home in the pandemic. So thank you for all those great questions. Um, I wanted to ask you a, just like one more question because I know we've gotten so much great uh, feedback from everyone. Thank you. Um, maybe tell us a little bit about the difference because we talked about the, the course that you have on Artists and Business Lab. What's the difference between that and, and the e-market readiness program, the, the seminar that you're gonna be giving there? A great question. Thanks, Lauren. Well, um, with the e-market, the e-market readiness program. Again, I will be talking about the product development principles that I am guided by every time I go through the design process. And I will also talk about how I take, um, take those principles and how I apply them to a few projects, one in Mexico and the other in the South Pacific in Fiji. And um, I'll talk about what were our challenges and how, how did we move through them. So I'll be taking you on a journey, you know, where there are, you know, different, different things that we run into when we're, you know, involved in the product development process. But one thing I might say about the e-market readiness program is that it's a live program and it brings together a whole group of aid to artisans, a long time and experienced presenters, many of which are my colleagues and friends. And so it's an amazing opportunity to have everybody in the same room. Mm -hmm. And it's the opportunity to ask a lot of questions. Um, as well, uh, I love the dynamic of it because all the pre presenters also learn and share with one another. And we all have so much to learn from one another. So not only is it a great networking opportunity, but you're, you will be able to get very specific information as it applies to your own needs. Yeah, yeah, I think that that really captures it. What's so different about the EMRP, it's really like a family. It sort of becomes this, um, this lovely alumni family that we have that just sort of continues. Um, you know, we still keep in touch with all of our MRP and our EMRP alumni, um, you know, we like to to see where you're going. We're invested in your um, in your growth, and so, you know, the connections that you make with um, with the other people in the program and the presenters is just it's a really special thing. And I think that's one of the the most um, important intangibles that come out of the training. So I, I think that's great. Um, we have another final question. So this is the last question. Uh, Carolina asks a question on a sensitive topic. I am interested in doing my own products using fabrics, et cetera, from Morocco and having them made by artisans in Morocco. I am concerned about the it being seen as cultural appropriation because I am not Moroccan. Do you think this sort of collaboration is acceptable or should I stick to traditional Moroccan crafts? That's a great question. I, I absolutely think it's sure you can do that. Just make sure you tell the story yeah. that you've been inspired by uh, traditional Moroccan fabrics. I mean, you have to think that design is continually evolving and every, every designer is making sense of the world they live in. And, you know, there's always a lot of crossover. Um, we're, we're all inspired by everything. That's what a designer does. But I would just say the important thing is to be transparent about it and say, I'm very inspired by these patterns in Morocco. And this is, maybe this is a line that is a, a, a modern aesthetic and that is rooted in traditional design. Mm -hmm. And so you have to frame it that way. Mm -hmm. But I look forward to seeing what you do. I mean, I'm sure it's going to be amazing. 
Yeah, and I think, you know, cultural appropriation, you know, you're working with, with Moroccan artisans and they are going to benefit from any sales that you make. So, you know, that's, it's, it's not just your designs, it's a collaboration and, you know, see it as a partnership between you and these artisans and together you're creating something that's going to benefit them uh, and then it's going to honor their traditional skills. And I don't think that that's cultural appropriation. Yeah. So. I think you bring up a very important topic though. Yeah. Because there is cultural appropriation happening when people aren't given credit. And so that's what I'm saying is just make sure you give people credit. Remember mm -hmm. that this is a collaboration Mm -hmm. and then you'll be you know you'll be fine and and everybody's going to have a good time because whether you're an artisan you know in morocco or your designer here there's so much good stuff that can come out of that collaboration and design will continue to evolve because design isn't static it's always changing it's always growing just make sure that people are credited and you know you're transparent about what you do yes I think that's a great place to end it. And uh, Debbie says, excellent course. I highly recommend. Debbie was one of our alumni, our EMRP alumni from last year. So thank you, Debbie. Um, she said it helped our organization so much on many levels. That's wonderful. So if you are interested in joining us either for the eMarket Readiness Program or for Mimi's course um, or for her one-on-one -on -one coaching, you can find all of that on artisanbusinesslab.org. So we'll post that in the chat and um, we'll be going live again on Monday with Stacey Edgar uh, to talk about artisan marketing and have a conversation again um, about uh, all things artisan marketing and we'll talk, uh, we'll talk with her, answer your questions. So, you know, take a look at our, our Facebook events coming up and, and we'll be coming back again to you uh, shortly. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mimi. It was great to have you in this conversation. Thank you, everybody. And thanks for all those great questions. Yes, excellent questions. <laughs> okay, have a good evening. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, Lauren.